Hello, BookTube. Recently, Jordan Peterson, of all people, has come back into my personal life through the portal of a young friend who is exactly in the demographic group that Jordan Peterson has made a billion dollars from. Young men between the ages of 18 and 25 who are famously aimless. They have dodgy relationships with their fathers and lack or feel like they lack the clear purpose of previous generations. They are lacking a roadmap and any guru or so-called thought leader out there who's willing to provide one, they will latch onto and make independently wealthy. <laughs> and that has recently come back into my own personal life and forced me to look at this subject again, especially the nostrums of Jordan Peterson himself, who is the, the guru of all gurus for this kind of subject matter. And that prompted me to make a video in which I look specifically, very critically, at Jordan Peterson's so-called 12 Rules for Life, the book that made him a squintillionaire. But since I pretty much knocked apart all of those rules, I felt it was incumbent on me to make an equivalent myself, even though I am not a guru and not a thought leader. What if, I thought, I made a list of rules that were the product of genuine experience and also genuine care and affection for that very demographic that Jordan Peterson doesn't care anything about at all? What if I made a brief list of do's and don'ts, of things that you can think about as principles to operate in your own life? And it wasn't hard to come up with such a list. These things are fairly self-evident. It's just a lot of them require very boring things like self-assessment or self-control. Self-help gurus typically don't preach that kind of thing because it won't make them money. Uh, but I'm not looking to make any money here. So I thought I would give you some BroTube advice. This is, a ma in a manner of speaking, a bro watch video. Someone could certainly do a bro watch video of this video. <laughs> and the only reason I'm doing it is because, two reasons. One, it's come back up in my mind. Someone has brought Jordan Peterson back up in my life and forced me to go over all this ground again, which I, only, I covered years ago. And two is that I am, as one of you put it so eloquently, the king tentacle of dude bros. <laughs> so who better to offer this advice? So I thought we'd do, we'll do five don'ts and five do's. And we'll start with the don'ts so that we finish on a relatively positive level. And I promise not to go on forever and ever, as some thought leader gurus do. <laughs> no, don't, uh, number one. So we'll, we'll count these down from ten to one. Ten is the first don't. And that is don't vet your friends. It's a common nostrum in dude bro self-help circles that you are the amalgamation of the five people you spend the most time with, with the clear implication being you should therefore vet them. You should therefore make them the highest quality five people that you can so that your own average goes up. <laughs> they are not employees. They are your friends. They will be dramatically, sometimes hilariously imperfect, just as you are dramatically and sometimes hilariously imperfect. If you start to treat them that way, you will end up with exactly what that attitude gets you. And you won't like it, so don't do it. <laughs> Even though all the other thought gurus tell you that you are the amalgamation of the five people you spend the most time with, it's obvious nonsense, and it's also a heartless, mercantile way to look at one of life's greatest relationships. So don't do it. Then number nine is don't play the stock market. I know this is a huge temptation for crypto bros or investing of any kind, elaborate three gigantic plasma computer screens, all with financial data on it. Playing the stock market is you capitalizing on the greed of others and extremely accentuating your own greed. That is unhealthy. Both of those things are unhealthy. It might look, if you have a certain amount of savoir-faire, a certain amount of, of skill or aptitude, to be money just waiting to be made. But it isn't money just made to be made. It's money being extracted from other people. So I would say no to it. Don't number eight, our third don't, is don't date. Don't go on dates. Just make friends. And if what you want out of a date is possible, it will be possible with one of your friends. And you will like it better that way. Dating is grotesquely artificial and unhealthy. <laughs> Obviously, if you have done it, then you know that, as no one ever has anything good to say about it. That's because there's nothing good about it. It's entirely artificial. It's just the kind of comforting artifice 
that men especially use when they don't want to simply pay for the thing that they want. The, the thing that they're not getting from their non-dating friends is usually the thing that is at the heart of the whole system. It has a gigantic apparatus all around it. There are pickup artists, there are scam artists, there are thought leaders and gurus who will take your money gladly to make you better at it under the assumption their whole world, their whole financial market is built on the assumption that you will assume that it is an unavoidable part of life. It isn't. It isn't at all. <laughs> it isn't at all. Just make friends. You can get better at making friends. You can be more energetic at making friends. But if you make friends with an agenda, and that's what going out on a date is, it's trying to make a friend with an agenda, it will blow up in your face and it deserves to. Instead, you make friends. And you don't have an ulterior motive. And if, if all the stuff that you want out of dating, both the physical stuff and the long-term relationship, maybe even marriage and a whole life together, develops out of that friendship, well, then you'll have nothing to regret. And you'll have no alternate person that you need to hide from the other person, and neither will they. So that's don't number three. Don't date. Don't number four, this is number seven on our list, is don't take on chemical addition, addictions. Don't do it. Between the ages of 18 and 25, you were in a perfect position. All of society, all of the people who are the drug peddlers who want you to be addicted to their product are concentrating on you in those years. And also that's when peer pressure is at its strongest, and there is no dumber reason to take on a physical chemical addiction, a drug addiction, than peer pressure. That is the dumbest possible reason. It's the dumbest possible reason to do anything. But a drug addiction? Where in the lonely hours of the night, in the years to come, when there's no money because it's all gone down that hole, your friends, the peers that you did it for to impress or to feel like you were part of that group, aren't going to be anywhere around. They'll either be dealing with it themselves or they'll be dead. They won't be with you. <laughs> so just don't do it. I know that Nancy Reagan's slogan, you know, just say no, came in for a good deal of abrobrium 50 years ago. But with a lot of the chemical addictions that are on offer now, vaping, juuling, especially smoking, of course, the chemicals involved have been extremely weaponized by the drug pushers that make them to make quitting almost impossible. So it's kind of Nancy Reagan's revenge. <laughs> really, the, the cleanest route is don't do it. If you don't do it, you won't have to worry about undoing it, especially since undoing it is virtually impossible. Do you really want to be thinking about this every single hour of every day for the rest of your life? Because that's what will happen even if you somehow manage to have the self-control necessary to stop the actual intake of the drug itself, whatever the drug is. You might have the strength of will necessary to stop yourself from taking more of it into your body, but these things have also been biochemically engineered to make you long for them. So that even if you stop the intake, you're going to be thinking about it for the rest of your life. You have other things to think about. Just don't do it. If you don't do it ever, then you don't have to undo it. <laughs> and then we'll do our, our last don't. So number six on our list here is don't outsource your thinking. This is offered unironically, despite the fact that it's in the middle of a list of do's and don'ts. <laughs> don't outsource your thinking to a guru, to a thought leader, to Jordan Peterson, to me, to anybody. What you're supposed to do with this list and any other list is sit down and think about it on your own. Don't just adopt it. Don't just have it tattooed on one bicep on one side and one bicep on the other. Six rules on one buttock, six rules on the other. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't adopt wholesale. Don't let anyone do your thinking for you. And be very wary of thought leaders or gurus or Jordan Peterson when they make it clear that that's what they want. <laughs> but when they make it clear that they really, what they really want from you is you hand over your money and your volition. You give them money. That's a crucial element. But you also give them the ability to tell you what to think. It's clearly something that they want to do. You should be wary of that. That leads nowhere. Who wants to voluntarily walk in to that kind of cheap, third-rate, knockoff thraldom? Just don't do it. Do your own thinking. Take all the advice in the world on board, mine or anybody else's, but then sit down and think about it. Don't just adopt it because you like the venue or the vessel. Anyway, those are the don'ts. We will continue on with do's now. We will do five do's, things that you should do in Steve's King Tentacle list of dude bro advice. Do number one, so this is number five on the list, is do regular exercise. And by exercise, again, I want to clarify, I do not mean exertion. 
exercise and exertion are two different things. Exertion is when you do something that's a little harder than it usually is. Lift a box, climb a flight of stairs. Exercise is doubled heart rate for 20 consecutive minutes or more. Exercise is when you're panting. It's when you're sweating. It's when you have to do it intentionally. You will almost certainly never exercise unintentionally. You have to do it intentionally, and you should. And I know that it's usually touted when, when the shrieking hypocrites in the dude bro advice circuit, they do not exercise. They smoke all day long. They are explicitly trading away their ability to exercise. They, they're, ex they're explicitly trading away their aerobic capacity. They have the aerobic capacity of a small infant. So they can't exercise no matter what they tell you, and no matter what, the, no matter what their B-roll footage might imply. <laughs> but no matter, they will tell you it's for uh, your physical health, and that is true. It is very, you are, you are meant to be moving. If you don't have a medical reason not to exercise, you should exercise. But I want to stress the mental aspect. And those of you who do go running on a regular basis, lift weights on a regular basis, that the swim or on a regular basis, will know that that is the primary benefit, is the mental aspect. Nothing clarifies your mind and gets the junk chemicals out better than exercise. Nothing does. You will think clearer. You will be less depressed. You will be less up in your own thoughts. You will be much more happy, much more satisfied and happier. If you exercise on a regular basis, I would say every day, some kind of exercise every day, if you can, if you're physically able to. Then the next do is do regular reflection. Men's sauna in corpore sano is what we're looking for. Sound mind in a sound body. Do regular reflection. Now, in my case, and in the case that I advocate, the easiest way to do it is to keep a personal journal on your computer. I wouldn't advise that since your computer is being tracked. Everything you type on your computer is being watched by malicious third parties. If you don't think that when you open your computer, you should. <laughs> if you don't think that, if you think that what you're doing on your computer is not being watched, you're being impossibly naive. So I wouldn't keep a personal journal on my computer, but in a book. And in that personal journal, you should challenge yourself. What do I really think about what happened today? here's how I rolled with it when it happened. What do I think of it now? Even if it reflects poorly on me, even if I wasn't wrong, now is the time for me to really assess that. You get into the habit of doing that for half an hour every day, you'll be very, very glad that you did. It will be remarkably clarifying. Then do number three is a little bit self-evident for, uh, for this particular venue, and that's to do a lot of reading. I know that it, it's... Uh, it's a typical thing for BroTube advice dispensers to say they don't ever do it, but it, it, it is renowned. It has been renowned for thousands of years that reading broadens the mind. But this is in one case uh, an example where a, a bromide like that is actually true. Reading broadens the mind in a way that nothing else does, not even travel. And it's easy to do. <laughs> it's, it's right around you all the time. I would say set time aside for it and consider it the same thing as setting time aside for exercise. That's essentially what it is. I would do a lot of it. I know I'm I'm speaking to the converted here because I'm I'm mostly I'm ta I'm a booktube channel and I'm mostly talking to other bookworms. But a video like this might get out to the broader YouTube ecosystem. So I wanted to mention that there. Don't view it as something that you did when you had to do it in school and now you get to abandon it. It's actually a really healthy thing to do. So you should do a lot of it, a, a chunk of it every day. Then the next do is regular financial savings. So it seems a little weird. It's not quite as philosophical or artsy-fartsy as the others, but it is important. It's a do that's worth considering. You should set aside a sum of money on a regular basis until you have a set-aside amount of money that is significant, that will cover your expenses, including rent, for five or six months. That, if, I don't know your exact situation, but I bet that's a large amount of money. And... The key to realize that when you think about it is baby steps. Take baby steps. Put aside a little here and a little there. Get into the habit. Like everything else in life, it's a muscle. You just have to strengthen it. That's all. You might look at your financial situation now, the money coming in, the money going out, and think there's no fat on the bone at all. There's no way that I could set it aside. But you can. You can. There's always something that you can do. A little bit. The key is to think baby steps. Save a little bit, then save a little more. The amount isn't so much important as the habit is. When you get to the habit of doing it, it'll start to sustain itself. And I cannot describe to you 
the peace of mind that comes from having that money set aside as a shock absorber. Now, there are plenty of shocks in life, plenty of turns that events can take that money, of course, won't do anything about. Money is itself not all that important. But there are plenty of things that having a shock absorber right there will really give you peace of mind. It really will. It will make you breathe a little easier, literally. You will literally breathe a little easier if you're not right on the edge of destruction at all times. So, And it, believe it or not, no matter how little money you have coming in, no matter how much money you have going out, it doesn't take all that long to slowly build that cushion. I would strongly urge that you do that. That would be one of the do's. But then the, uh, the final do, something I've urged on this channel many, many times. I urged it to many, many young people before there was such a thing as YouTube. And that is to make something. Create something. Don't just absorb. And don't fall into the stupid fallacy that is often promulgated in the arts world, and even sometimes, I hate to say it, in the book world, that there are two types of people in the world, creative and non-creative. That is absolutely not true. That is absolutely false. Everyone is creative. It is just a muscle. <laughs> when we talk about creative people and not creative people, the only thing we're really talking about is the people who exercise that muscle and the people who don't. You have it. You have that muscle, same as anybody else. And it really is good for you to use it. It's also good for everybody else. I have always pointed that out. You should create, and the creation should be something that ultimately is accessible to other people. So we're not talking about keeping a journal here. We're talking about something you make that other people can eventually experience in some way, whether it's audio equipment or music or uh, writing or make something and eventually somehow make it accessible to the world. I'm saying you have to make money off it. I'm not saying it has to be a side hustle. But even if you don't make it accessible to the rest of the world, still do it. Don't have everything stop with you. Create something encourage and grow that part of you, you'll be very, very glad that you did. You're not, in fact, a complete person until you do. So there you go. There's some BroTube advice to make up for the BroTube advice that I demolished in another video today. Those are five do's and five don'ts of BroTube advice from the king tentacle of the BroTube world. <laughs> so there you go, BookTube. Don't say I never gave you anything. <laughs> I'll wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. Thank you, Book Two.